So let's say that someone has been reading the suttas and they have a small or large amount of clarity regarding what the Buddhist teaching is. Mm -hmm. um, they're able to explain it to others, they're able to explain it to themselves. Everything makes sense. And, um, and yet, if they ask themselves honestly um, whether they're still whether they're free from suffering or whether they're still subject to suffering mm. it becomes clear that they aren't so what is it then that um, needs to improve or, or evolve further for that information that a person has to become an insight a direct insight that actually liberates them Yeah, how to move from ideas, from the right ideas, to insight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess a lowball kind of approach to that would be to say, well, the ideas you have, are you applying them to the extent that you understand them? Mm. Um, so... What would be one common idea that um, you know every Buddhist knows but might not apply? For example, like you know what you might not know what greed means in like the truest, most kind of enlightened sense, mm -hmm. but you have some idea of what greed is that aligns with your own experience. So, are you giving into that mm. when it arises, mm. or are you? not giving into it, I guess. That could be one avenue of questioning for you. So, um, because the thing is, the, the, the people would um, become content with where the point where they have reached because they would have realized that a change has factually occurred compared to... Um, very often, a change has occurred in terms of, um, well, their opinions. Like, they, they, their opinions about things were reflecting back to where they were. It would become clear that they were very wrong mm. in the past compared to what it would be now just on account of the information. But the crucial distinction there is that um, having an opinion in line with the teaching, for example, um, in the suttas, you would see opinions that are very clearly not in line with the suttas, mm -hmm. like the ascetics of other sects when they would go around saying that um, there is no kamma, there is no, there is no action, there is no uh -huh. um, uh, fruits and results of good and bad actions. There is no mother, there is no father. Mm. Uh, or in a modern sense, you might have people adhering to. I don't know, nihilism or, uh, you know, various sort of uh, worldly ideologies. And you feel factually that you've been able to effect a change from that to, let's say, now your belief is anatta. You believe in anatta. You believe in the Four Noble Truths. You believe in kamma. You believe in uh, freedom from suffering and, and whatnot. Mm. But the thing is, those are opinions, or those are beliefs. Mm. And uh, view is something different. Mm. Well, not necessarily different, but something deeper than that. So you can, the point being, changing your opinion is necessary for you to begin the practice in the first place. Uh -huh. But your view has not necessarily changed. Mm. And the measurement of, of your view changing is, what is it? Yeah, yeah, but that, like, what is the uh, criteria for that, which we just mentioned? Oh, well, you, you need to hear the true teaching. And again, no, no, the and criteria again. for defining what is Sotapati, like, because again, you, you have the same opinion, like, you still, you, you also believe that uh, there is suffering, there is, uh, that craving is the origin of suffering, that the cessation of suffering is the ah, escape. And now you're asking what is the difference between believing that yes. and actually a noble disciple realizing the Four Noble Truths. Right. 
Well, you see, belief is something, colloquially speaking, you're not quite sure. Like something could be the case, but you're not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. You might have good reasons to believe a certain thing, and most of the time you can conduct yourself based on that belief, but that belief will always be bound up with a sense of doubt. Mm. Belief and doubt go together. Mm. But now, when the Buddha talks about the right view, that doesn't go together with that doubt, which is on the side of belief. Mm. So right view has that confidence or that certainty. And that is a distinction that we can make, it seems to me, between what is actually a right view, the Samaditi of the suttas, and the belief, um, the way people colloquially use like belief. Yeah. So, okay, that's one angle from which you could approach it, which we can come back to that later. But um, so how does it feel? What is the, the most... Um, because a person might... Again, you, you might have studied Buddhism for so long and 20, 30 years that you kind of feel like you don't have doubts about this anymore. Like some of it might even have been confirmed by random, you know, little insights that you had here and there. Oh, I see. And uh, <clears throat> and you can you can kind of convince yourself. I mean, we've met people like you. Yeah. They don't um, admit the fact that there's this doubt. Yeah. Well, so then we have to come back to our discussion on authenticity. Like people need to be honest with themselves. Am I still liable to suffering? Yeah. So that's it. So the the. Uh, right, the criteria for who is a sotapanna or not, more than just asking what, how sure am I of this? Because mm. you know, many kind of uh, you can deceive yourself can be. like okay, I'm 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 really sure, but you might have not considered something. Yeah, exactly. And so later yeah. on, you might still be shaken. Yeah, yeah. So many people can be express like you know insane amounts of, of certainty in mm. regards to various things, but the right view is measured by Obviously, yes, you need some degree of authenticity, but more practically, are you um, still liable to suffering hmm. on in, in any shape or form? Like if you if you ask yourself, do you still uh, depend on on um, certain coping mechanisms or certain strategies for you to escape that suffering, and at the same time you think that uh, you're free from doubt, that you you have truly understood. That craving is the root of suffering. Well, that doesn't go together. You you wouldn't have any need to to run away from suffering in that sense if you have understood the escape. Hmm. So that's one of the clear signs that what you have more is a is a belief or is or is an opinion, and your view is still not in line with um, with the Buddhist teaching fundamentally. Hmm. So, um, so back to what you said about doubt. Um, so. What is it that would then turn a belief, the same opinion or the same belief that you started from? So it's not that it changes. Like you, you hear um, the teaching of the Buddha, and and it's in the content, like the the phrasing and the and the the expression is the same. It's mm -hmm. not like there was some hidden um, stanza or, or mm -hmm. something that you would now come up with that you couldn't before. It's more, um, well, what is it? What what's the difference? What is it that makes that belief turn into something that it's uh, impossible to doubt? Mm -hmm. Well, it's got to be all encompassing view mm. because if it isn't there's room for doubt yes of course but um, how do you make it all encompassing well that has got to do with the Yoni Soman Sikara yeah so um, we can so that's exactly why the uh, the so to say there's two conditions for the arising of the right view uh -huh. One of them is the utterance of another mm. through which you change your opinion, you could say, from the very start. But if you don't have Yoni Samana Sikara, then all you're left with is the utterance of another that now became your utterance. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it became integrated, let's say. No, it, sta it stays on the level of ideas. Like yeah. you might genuinely hear something new, 
or somebody might confirm something that you already believed and now you are more certain and you agree with it like and you agree with yeah, it yeah. and so but you now have more certainty like oh this other person that has great faith in says the same thing but that's still not it yeah or or even again you, you had a completely wrong opinion you changed it but um if if that liability to doubt and suffering is still there it hasn't permeated like mm. you said it hasn't become all-encompassing so that it becomes a view now um what so let's say uh common example craving is suffering mm. that's a belief or, or the root of cra- uh, suffering is craving mm. that's a belief or an opinion that almost every buddhist might have but why is it not all-encompassing without just going to the um, textbook answer answer of, of Yonisa Munasikara well there has to be a, a suitable basis let's say in one's experience for those statements to land mm-hmm. so to speak so if someone is living a life that is rooted by a large in acting out of craving, then you can meet someone who is factually free from craving and who tells you that craving is suffering. Mm. And then you might still agree with that on the, on the level of ideas, failing to see that that's completely disconnected from how you, from how you conduct yourself in your daily life. Mm. So that discrepancy um, has to end in so that it creates let's say a basis for that idea to land so that it becomes an insight that doesn't leave anything out yeah so so that would be obviously yeah, again uh, the first step um so you you hear it becomes even more of a empty opinion if you're if if you quote unquote believe in it for you but your day-to-day actions are totally mm-hmm. um based on other uh assumptions that, it, that yeah. are that are contrary to that uh so let's say then that you have restrained your living to the best of your ability to, to, to the point where you're aware you live according to the idea or belief that you acquired that uh, craving is the root of suffering and you mm-hmm. never do anything that you know is rooted in craving. Um, but then, so what, what is left there? Right, well, this is, I was going to say, like this discrepancy that you mentioned, you still, you can kind of take that principle, I guess, and keep going with it. Insofar as if you have the opinions, but your views, like you can tell, okay, I'm not free from suffering, so my views aren't quite aligned with my opinions. That means I believe something that I don't actually like I, I I say that I believe something, but I don't actually. I guess you could put it that way. Mm. So trying to kind of recognize, okay, there's there is a discrepancy somewhere. Like what? I guess a one one example that's probably super super common for most kind of most Buddhists is. Getting so used to just like denying, oh no, there's no self, no self, no self. Being able to actually kind of say like, okay, well, let's stop dismissing that and actually look for it. Like, clearly I have self-view. So kind of letting that manifest in your experience, not just pushing it away because it's wrong. It's not in line with your belief. Um, because if it was your view, you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, that's one one important point. You need to be willing to accept, and that that um, feeds back into that authenticity. T- willing to accept that you still have the fundamental illness. Mm-hmm. You might have uh, found, like the belief is on the level of, oh look, that's the best best doctor over there, mm-hmm. and and that's your belief, and it's accurate. But if you don't uh, go through with the treatment, which will be painful because, you know, it's it's require you to accept that you are sick. Mm. It's no longer just an impersonal um, 
acknowledgement of how great the doctor is. It's now about you and your condition. Yeah. So um, it requires you then to have that authenticity to say, yes, it doesn't matter how much I agree with all the, the theory of, of that this doctor talks about of, of how to cure this disease. Mm. Fundamentally, I am still not cured. Yeah, so ironically, you have to start by taking it quite personally. Yeah, that's it. So if you use the beliefs to kind of cover up your wrong view, mm. that's that's one of the main uh, obstacles, because then you, you will... The belief is supposed to... Like that external utterance of another is supposed to be, um, for the lack of a better word, applied to the wrong understanding that you have which means you need to have admitted to yourself that that wrong understanding is there hmm. and that our wrong understanding will be um, sort of indirectly uh, brought to the surface by the presence of suffering so if if you don't allow suffering to arise to begin with like as as you said your first response is to get rid of it then you have nothing for the belief to ironically apply to like mm. the, there's no work for you to do really mm. um, which is but in, in a wrong way like instead of no work to do because you got to the end it's like no work to do because you're refusing to start yeah you just uh, kind of uh, like content with just pointing to where the goal is but not walking there yourself mm -hmm. so that's the um, the the admission that has to come first like as yeah I uh, I understand, or I have the the, view, the opinion or the belief that um, the five aggregates are impermanent, the, that they're suffering, that they're not self. But my view is different. Because if it wouldn't be, you would at least be a Sotapanna. And, and you wouldn't have all the suffering that you have, uh -huh. clearly. So um, then the the right place for that belief, you you will start to see that that information that you have is not just something for you to like hold as a trophy or something. It's 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 the stuff that you have to use, like uh, like a like an like a, I don't know um, like a shovel mm. that you need to use in yeah. order to be digging. Yeah, digging with a knife. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah delving or digging with a knife. Yeah, yeah. And it's through that belief or that opinion, it's telling you kind of where you're gonna go. Mm. But if you just again satisfied with the content of the of the belief or, or the view, uh, you're not going to be using it for the purpose that it actually is meant to mm -hmm. uh, fulfill. So um, the other thing as well is the liability to doubt mm -hmm. is um, like you will never transcend doubt by improving the opinion. Or improving the information mm. to some theoretically perfect point it's precisely by recognizing well you would only be able to do that again if you have admitted to yourself that you're still liable to suffering and then you realize what is doubt like what is what is actually doubt is it doubt that I that my um, opinion or, or information is not perfectly extensive and comprehensive or is it doubt that when my information or uh, beliefs are not comprehensive enough I resist that discomfort and then on that level you'll be able to now apply the information that craving is suffering and you would overcome doubt through that avenue not by getting you know perfect definitions of the of the i don't know 115 types of suffering that correspond to the craving in such and such sense space or something mm -hmm. like some sort of abhidhamma analysis it would be a concrete application of that belief in okay there is doubt there is unpleasantness and discomfort on account of that doubt and i know that anything that i do rooted in um, craving against the discomfort of that doubt will be ironically against well will be perpetuating the wrong view mm. that it's the discomfort that is the suffering not the resistance to it so see you have the same belief 
on paper, craving is suffering, and you will be applying it grow, uh, uh, in a way that's actually growing the wrong view. Mm. Because you, you, you still imply that it's, on some level, you imply, I am suffering because I'm not clear enough about how craving is suffering on the level of information. Mm. And you don't see that it's actually, uh, well, that's what you, where Yoni Samar Sikara would come in. Yeah. You don't see that it's actually you here and now in regards to that lack of knowledge, resisting that discomfort. That is your failure. The other thing I want to say is, so that uh, craving that you have in relation to not knowing the answer to something, mm. um, it needs to be kind of, the information is not applied to sort of get rid of it, which again would be falling into that um, misapplication of the information to basically like deny the fact that you're sick mm. as quickly as possible. It's, uh, as we keep saying, it's for you to, practically speaking, be able to endure that discomfort. So mm. if you still have the background assumption that the information is sort of meant for the purpose of dealing with discomfort in, in, in that direct sense, like uh, knocking it off, then uh, that's going to be, again, still proliferating the same wrong view. Um, yeah, so the doctor can prescribe medicine and say these pills two times a day those pills five times a day you can have all that information if you don't take them it's not going to make any difference yeah well or or you take them when you want to take them yeah yeah you uh -huh. don't take them in the uh, so the the development of uh yoni samanasikara how does it start uh-huh which is so that, you know, mixed with that information you have, it can become mm. the right view. Or let, let's put it this way. Um, what do the suttas define is the progression towards uh, the purification view? What do the suttas define? As the progression towards, or the prerequisites for the purification view. Uh -huh. What do the sutta say needs to happen first before one's views can be purified? Yeah. Uh -huh. Gradual training. Yeah. Yeah, but which means what in this case? Virtue uh -huh. first and foremost. You have to. If you just think of Yonis Amanskara's kind of perspective, then you need to kind of get your nose out of it, and that is mm. going to mean restraining precepts first. Mm refinement from there yeah so purification of views uh, sorry yeah so purification of views is not the first step mm -hmm. in the um, uh, relay chariot sutta that, uh -huh. that the, the sariputta was it was defining the the steps of the training and um ironically many people would think that you start from there mm -hmm. and that's where you would be endlessly uh, just uh almost like going back and forth in terms of beliefs and opinions like you know reintegrating um syncretizing and, and, and mixing and matching yeah and that is precisely why it stays on the level of opinions and beliefs yeah and why it doesn't go further yeah so if you you will still have so that's the, the, the another thing i wanted to mention you will inevitably you will have views and and opinions like so that's why it's important to get the information from the outside like you can't uh, become a buddha by yourself mm. you need to 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 um, get that utterance of another you won't be able to arrive at it by yourself but uh that's another thing in like important to recognize as well because well without that how would you even know for example that virtue is is important mm. how would you even know that what purification of mind entails, which is the second step. How would you even know that you're supposed to emphasize purification of virtue, which for most people would not be the first thing that comes to mind. Mm. So you need the utterance of another for you to even start with these, um, with the graduate training, with all these prerequisites. It's just that you, um, 
you don't emphasize it past the level where it motivates you to do these things mm. like beyond that point you realize okay i i got enough information to recognize the importance of these things and now the purification of view will come if i purify my virtue sufficiently and as a result of purifying my virtue not as a result of meditation techniques i purify my mind as well mm. and then you'll be able to see that information that you uh, obtained initially you'll be able to see as we say on the right level yeah because uh it's well obviously as this as to say it's the five hindrances that prevent yeah. the um seeing things as as they are quote unquote mm. um so it's not um it's not again through through concentration practices it's you could basically boil it down to saying it's your way of behaving in the world including by mind uh that goes against those principles that you understand in theory that's what the five hindrances are in mm. a very broad sense like you 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 to the point where you can even be having the right information that restlessness is unwholesome craving is unwholesome all these things that are unwholesome but with that information you're acting out of the five hindrances mm. that's how subtle it is so um all, but obviously you won't be able to see that until you purify your virtue first so that's why purification of mind comes second mm. and the graduate training always presents it in that order so but then once those bases are covered now you have a chance of factually see, even seeing what craving means mm -hmm. before that you couldn't and again you you have to ask yourself like so because sometimes people have a think that okay on account of this or other practice they were able to see what craving is but so did it actually require you to purify your virtue like do you see directly that without virtue it would have been impossible for me to get to that point mm. or does it feel like if i had just you know known one detail or another about this the performance of this technique i would have gone there without any virtue mm -hmm. if if that's the case it means it's not the purification of you at least that describing the suttas yeah because as he's saying it's like it's like you got to the to the second chariot without the first one uh -huh. that's literally impossible that's the simile it gives like mm -hmm. you take the first chariot it takes you somewhere but not past that point from then on you need to take the second chariot which will, t which will take you to where the third chariot is yeah so if you s magically were able to jump from the first to the third that tells you that well that that's that's not the same training that we're that we're talking about yeah so this kind of this vaguely reminds me of just something i've been sort of thinking about the past few days um kind of using weight loss as an analogy how to put this I mean, take somebody who wants to lose weight. Um, you, you give them the option, oh, you can just press this button and automatically you'll lose weight. They, they'll press it and, you know, a few months down the line, they'll be in the same position they were before. Because mm. if you want to lose weight, you kind of actually need to shift your goal, not to losing weight, but to having a lifestyle that is conducive to having a healthier body, to having a healthy, active lifestyle, essentially. So if somebody can bring themselves to value that type of lifestyle, more or less the issue is solved, even if they're still not at the kind of point of weight loss mm. that they wanted to get to yet. Because it's about that mode of being mm. that's what will actually get you there it's not just kind of the magical like snap of a finger oh my gosh i'm skinny yeah even if go celebrate with cake even if technically obviously there isn't <laughs> something that can take you to the, to the right view by moment like even when people think they get these insights if you get to the nitty-gritty details of it they're contradictory with the sutta like it's not in line with what the buddha actually describes as uh as the three characteristics 
or what, what he describes as the five aggregates and so on. Uh, but even if, theoretically, it were possible to have a momentary insight of that kind that is factually accurate, and then you, you were to lose it, well, the fact that the person wouldn't be putting the emphasis on the things that the Buddha did put the emphasis on, which is virtue, or like in this case, the healthy lifestyle, as you mentioned, means it's not the, it's not actually the right view because um, like the, the 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 Buddha would describe it's like a sotapanna is not just someone who has wholesome qualities. It's somebody who understands wholesome is wholesome, unwholesome is unwholesome, mm-hmm. the root of the wholesome and the root of the unwholesome. So in, in other words, the sotapanna is not just someone who got thin or got skinny. It's someone who understands the path that that uh, regardless of how fat they might be now, it will take them to be skinny at some mm. point. So if like, again, it was a magical button that they pressed, there's mm. absolutely no understanding uh, right. of, of what is it that, that takes you there. So like, so the, because actually that happens, like there's quite often a view that um, if you just get like an experience of cessation of suffering, that qualifies you as a as a stream enterer. But again, that's like somebody who and and you don't know how it happened. You were just meditating for I don't know intensively for a few weeks, and then this experience came up, and then you have to on top of everything, you have to ask other people to like confirm mm-hmm. or, or or get guidance on it. Meaning like again, you suddenly lost twenty pounds. You don't know why. Well, that's not that's not really um, not that's that concerning. Thing. Yeah. No, this this will sound like a joke, but I used to wonder if you could give somebody stream entry with like a VR headset and like the right kind of mm. program yeah. put on it. Like a, that was yeah. something I enjoyed. Or hallucination, wondered. like you know, you bring them to halluc- hallucinatory state, which is essentially what meditative techniques are doing, and then you kind of induce them, uh, make them think about something while in there in that hallucinatory state, mm. and, and that's literally like. <laughs> What uh, what people would think of as you know why you need samadhi in order to then give rise to wisdom, uh-huh. uh, but uh, again that's that's just a magic trick and you haven't understood mm-hmm. the, the root of the unwholesome in the sense that as we were saying before you would be free from doubt in regard to it and mm-hmm. then you would be able to explain to somebody else exactly what they would have to do in order to get to that point and it wouldn't depend on like oh when when you're this type of person you have to do this or when you have this situation you have to do that it would be on a very universal level of what great aversion and delusion are which you have understood in yourself mm. plus you've understood how you came to that understanding yeah it's, exactly so if you were to like lose that understanding let's say out of some obviously that's not going to happen but theoretically mm. you would know exactly how to get back to it and that's why you w- actually wouldn't lose it yeah in, in so words. that noble disciple is sort of in between the tujana and Arahat, like him, he knows how he became a noble one. That's one thing. That is sort of retrospectively looking back. These things I did all right, which resulted in this right view just now. Being on the path, he knows if I keep doing this, and he's beyond doubt about that, that's going to lead to the complete cessation of suffering. So this is why it's important to organize one's thinking along those three different kinds of understanding and not just think, I'm completely confused. And one insight, and everything is going to be solved at once. Yeah, and and also, um, so because again, you you can have that kind of assimilated and, and say, yeah, I do I do see that based on this understanding. If I were to just repeat it, I would eventually uh, get to our answer. But the question is like, is it something universal? Can you truly say that it's something universal that you understood, like that applies to absolutely everyone? With, to the point where you would have the confidence, actually, when, as the sutras would say, like, there, uh, uh, a noble disciple would know there is no ascetic or Brahmin in the entire universe who could fundamentally rightly disagree with this. Hmm. Hmm. No, they can't accept another teacher for that matter either. Yeah, uh-huh. so he would say it's like a, like a strong post that then, you know, w- whichever direction the wind comes, it wouldn't be able to move it. Hmm. So in the same way, I would say the, the noble disciple would be perfectly um, 
established in their view and to some it might sound like the ultimate close-mindedness yeah or like a fundamental belief except that for him it is now no longer the level of exactly belief. Yeah. so because it's again so it's these universal truths that you recognize even before it's not that you kind of developed um, how to put it it's not that you kind of uh, again it's not just that you lost weight which is like something that you did Mm. And that's most of the time what people see as, as mental development. No, you understood the principle of losing weight, which was there always. Mm. Like, if you just eat less than you spend, you will lose weight. Mm. So, you understand that principle. And it's not that in the past, when you weighed, I don't know, 500 pounds, that principle was not there. No, that principle was operating there the whole time. Mm. So if it's not something universal that you understood, it's like you just understood like if I do this practice like this in this way and you have all this sort of system of of methods that you bind together, but there's nothing universal about it. And most certainly you would you would not see that this is what everyone has to do in order to get to stream entry. Then that's not a universal insight.